Okay, um, thank you. I'm Abade Vallejo, I'm an immunologist. I'm based at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, but I study two things, and I wear two hats, and that's reflected in my title. And that is, I study pa uh, pediatric rheumatic diseases, which is a, uh, an example of chronic inflammatory syndrome. And the other one is aging biology. And I always say, I'm in the Department of Pediatrics, that's why I study uh, aging. But my view of aging is really one that cuts across, it, it's really aging across the lifespan rather than aging at the terminal stages of life. Um, and anyway, um, as an immunologist, as a student in immu immunology, I have always been fascinated by three things. One is the fact that uh, being alive is dangerous because the estimate is that there are about 10 to the 15 antigenic uh, specificities that we will encounter from the time you're born to the time you're, you, you die. The human genome is not nearly uh, that large to deal with those threats. And thanks to the immune system where there's a lot of genetic processes and biochemical processes, you know, the most powerful perhaps here is gene recombination, gene editing, um, and what are called as re receptor, uh, receptor editing and receptor maturations. All those genetic processes are important in, in uh, uh, fending off the universe, and that's why the immune system is very diverse. It is more important that each T cell is different than they are uh, common. It's kind of like American society, it's more important that you and I are different than we are uh, common. So, um, and the challenge really is how we generate and maintain that diver uh, the immunological diversity. And here's one thing, immunological diversity is predetermined in utero. 90 to 95% of your T cells and B cells are determined by the time you're born. So that's your bank. And for the rest of your life, that's what you're, you're going to, to spend, right? Um, and then another thing that is very important that we are just slowly beginning to realize is the fact that immune cells are very plastic. They're, they're functionally plastic, meaning that they, their function is affected by their environment, but at the same time, they can dictate the environment, depending on where they are. Um, and then the other one for the last few years is the fact, uh, if, if, do the next slide please, is that actually the pre-existing diversity gets reshaped through our lifetime. And uh, this is uh, a summary of the work that uh, I and a lot of other people have contributed to so if you look at the neonate and the young, so we talk about diversity. The, the classic T cell receptor is very diverse. Uh, here, all of us, there's about 10 to the 10 T cells that circulate in, in, your, in your veins, and you need that every day. And there are 10 to the 10 different T cells. So if you re reduce that diversity, you're in trouble. And that's why a lot of immune-mediated diseases depend of, is dictated or determined by the contraction of that diversity. With age, it turns out that we lose that diversity. You don't have to think about disease. Just the process of aging, you lose it. So if, if you think that the older adult is a defective version of the young, you may be right. But wait a minute, actually it's not the case because the immune system is so robust that it can compensate, now it generates a new level of diversity, so instead of depending on a T cell receptor, now it acquires new receptors. It, it steals from its cousin, the NK cells. Now it expresses NK receptors and maintain uh, a, a, a different type of diversity. So the challenge has been, how do you tap into these different levels of diversity to maintain immune health across the lifespan. 
And so, uh, to, to, yes, the, the, uh, in terms of research priorities, I've identified here some of the things that I think would be something that in a forum like this, we have to start thinking. One is that we need to have a paradigm shift from a simple young versus old comparison, but recognize different biologies. It is not, you know, just pediatricians know that the, the, the child is not a miniature adult. And by the same token, an older adult is not a defective version of a young. Um, I say that because I, you know, I'm pushing there. Uh -oh. And the other one is, um, I believe that it's time for human immunology to be at the forefront rather than the previous approach, which is a mouse to human translation. I think we need to, we need to start focusing on human to mouse translation, where we study first human biology and then go into the animal and ask the question, specific questions that so we, we go away from the tr trying to translate animal biology to human biology. The other one is, uh, I talk about uh, plasticity. Um, different biologies have different uh, homeostatic mechanisms. And uh, uh, in, in gerontology and in geriatrics, there is now something we call as a physiologic construct of successful aging. Meaning that uh, in simple terms, what is the difference between a 90-year-old in the community who is functionally independent versus a 90-year-old in the nursing home? Um, and, and so uh, those are important uh, questions that a young versus old comparison can never answer. Um, and then, one of the things that I've been involved with is something which we call as premature aging in the immune system. This, uh, it turns out, uh, I study children with rheumatic disease. It turns out for all intents and purposes, a two, year, a, a two month old child with juvenile idiopathic arthritis actually has an immune system, or a T cell repertoire for that matter, that is of a, uh, that of a 90 year old that otherwise does not have arthritis, who is doing well, and yet in the child who has arthritis uh, has that phenotype. And so we, we, I, having found this, uh, having discovered this, uh, we decided that we have to change our thinking in terms of age, uh, you know, aging, it is really aging and immune health across the lifespan rather than um, you know, focusing on uh, a, a lot of the medical and biological paradigms are really in young adults, right? Uh, but again, we have to realize that there are different biologies. And the one that is most important to me that we've been studying for the last couple of years, and thanks to UPMC Enterprises, this has become uh, possible, is the integration of immune function with other domains other domains of function. Immunologists are very good at describing pathways, signal transduction, mechanisms of how we control immune system and inflammation, but then we forget that the immune system does not uh, work on its own. And so, uh, you know, when we think, think about integrating big data, I think that is that is critical, and just lastly, uh, you have this. So you can you can read it in your, um, you know, in the in the, the meeting proceedings. Uh, with this is a lifestyle medicine, so in translation science research, I think you know you you, you talk about diet. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know work on diet work on physical activity, work on behavioral interventions. And if you look at the literature, they always have associations with quote unquote inflammatory cytokines. Um, and to me, uh, those correlations are great, but if you think about immune health, uh, you really have 
to test for immune protection rather than the simple surrogates. The surrogates or the biomarkers would probably help you um, in terms of doing some of the practical things that you could do in a clinic. But at the end of the day, uh, you do not know where that IL-6 is coming from. Um, but if you think about immune health, your diet, the, the diet affects how the immune system works. Um, physical activity, there is evidence. Uh, I'm certainly interested in that. There's evidence that there are changes in the immune repertoire. Is that change good or bad? I have no idea, but it's a certainly part of uh, you know, fertile research. Vaccines, it's flu season, right? Uh, and I'm always one of those who are vocal uh, critics of social policy where our number one targets of the flu vaccine are people 65 and older. But we know, the science tells us, that that is not immune protective. It's not very efficacious in older adults, you know, 65 and over. If, you are, if you're 60 and younger, you, it will work for you. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, that's our target population. And is that because the immune system of the older adult is defective? I don't think so. Because the only, say, the only reason we say it's less efficacious is because the outcome measures, the methods that we are using to clarify uh, immune uh, protection is uh, our, our trials that were done in the young, not in the old. So, uh, so that's my take, and uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. So um, I'll just go somewhat nonlinearly. We were talking about a, a system with tremendous amount of diversity. So Allison, maybe you can comment about the role of the microbiome and potential implications um, for lifestyle medicine. Yeah, sure. I think the microbiome is obviously a very good complement to what we've been just talking about with the immune system. Um, I'm Allison Morris. I direct the Center for Medicine and Microbiome at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm also a pulmonary physician, so I got into this by looking at the, the influence of the lung microbiome on disease. Um, in terms of microbiome research, the lung has been sort of really relatively ignored, and the field has really been dominated by the gut people. Um, it, it's much easier to get stool samples than it is to get lung samples. Um, but, you know, so that's how I got into this. Um, and now with the center, um, and we're very involved with a diverse array of projects sort of across uh, the university as well as uh, with other institutions. And so I've started becoming interested in many of the themes that have been talked about here today because, um, uh, you know, you said the brain ties all of this together, but I would argue that the microbiome can also tie almost everything we've been talking about here together. Um, so all the themes that were mentioned yesterday and today, clearly, you know, diet and nutrition, that's obvious the microbiome plays a role there and can be influenced by that. But, you know, there, there are changes with sleep, there's impact with exercise, stress, um, addiction. Um, fruit flies without a microbiome have different behaviors around alcohol addiction than those with a normal microbiome, something you may not really think about. Um, and the, the environment, both the built environment and the natural environment, all um, may uh, interact with the microbiome. The relationships of the microbiome with these diseases are very complex and likely bi-directional. Um, so they both change with uh, the different influences uh, and then also can uh, act uh, causally to, to change um, phenotypes, to change outcomes, to change inflammation. Uh, and I think the other theme about the microbiome that has come up with many of these other things, is, as Abe was discussing, this is something that contributes a lot of diversity. Um, so as he mentioned, our genetic, our genes are very fixed and limited. Um, you know, there are only 22,000 genes. Uh, the microbial genes that people have, um, are there's greater than three million genes, and they change over the course of a lifespan and they can be um, influenced and targeted by a variety of things I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the other, I think, important aspect of this that Abe brought up as well and was mentioned yesterday is we need to look over the lifetime. 
Um, early uh, exposures are critical in setting the microbiome, starting with the method of delivery, um, but then continuing through dietary changes um, as children age, um, what they're exposed to in their environment. Um, there's lots of data on uh, things like you know, being on a farm versus being in an inner city and how that changes your microbiome, how that then changes your immune response, um, and diseases that are influenced by um, autoimmunity or an, an inflammation. Um, I think there is uh, really a tremendous opportunity uh, in looking at this therapeutically, uh, uh, but I think a lot right now, there's a lot of hype. You know, if you go on the internet, you see a ton of microbiome uh, ads, there's, you know, there's a cookbook for like how to fix your microbiome. Um, if you go to Whole Foods, they'll sell you lots of very expensive things, um, you know, saying that you're going to have a, a healthy microbiome. Um, so I, I think where the research challenges are is really kind of bringing it back down to, um, to, to the science and less of the hype. Um, and we have, I think, a lot of work uh, to do. I think a lot of the, the priorities are going to be in figuring out exactly all these influences because it's really, and I think this is, we'll talk more about systems biology with where that's going to be really useful. Um, as I said, much is focused on the gut, but there's micro, microbiome um, uh, communities throughout the body and they all interact and they all have distant signals through metabolo metabolites, um, through shaping the immune system, um, and we don't really understand that. Most of the focus has been on bacteria. If you look, most of the articles, most of the scientific articles in the lay public as well are on bacteria, mostly because that's, they're the dominant organisms, but they're also much easier and cheaper to study. But things like viruses and fungi are also present and may have important uh, roles. Um, so I think you know, we have a lot of opportunity to look in, in ways that we can influence the microbiome, um, starting with prebiotics, so a lot of the things that were talked about um, yesterday in terms of diet, um, fiber, <coughs> things like that. Um, probiotics, actually taking the bacteria, um, uh, genetically engineered bacteria that can do different functions. Um, and then uh, things like fecal transplant, um, we haven't quite gotten to being able to do lung bacteria transplant um, but maybe in the future. Um, and I think there are also the, the microbiome can be a biomarker of disease. Um, we, we see signals, um, for example, in intensive care unit patients, their baseline lung and gut microbiome can predict things like their mortality and their number of ventilator-free days, um, independent of other uh, factors that typically predict outcome. Um, so I think, you know, this is something that we'll continue to see as an important area in the upcoming years um, and looking at uh, particularly the interplay with the immune system um, and with, uh, with diseases. And I just want to mention one thing um, that we have started uh, at the University of, of Pittsburgh that, to try to get at some of these questions. Uh, and it's a biorepository called MedBio where we are uh, enrolling uh, research participants and other studies as well as some, some clinical patients and we're getting baseline blood for uh, genomic uh, testing as well as microbiome samples. Um, and so we're, do, we're able to put together the genome and the microbiome and access the medical record. Um, and because it's a sort of, you know, Western Pennsylvania, people don't tend to leave and they tend to continue to get their care um, at UPMC if they've, uh, if they've started there. Um, we have potential to look longitudinally at what happens and can we predict disease and then can we go back and modify it. Um, we've uh, enrolled over 3,000 patients so far and have started doing sequencing on the genome um, and the microbiome. Um, so I think that those kinds of things will be resources to help uh, in, in investigating these sorts of issues. Thanks, Allison. So just kind of continue the nonlinear theme. So maybe Torin, maybe you could, you already had uh, some thoughts yesterday. Maybe you can touch on some of these points, uh, perhaps in your, in your context as uh, director of the Aging Institute. And maybe also, I think there were a lot of people in my conversations that were fascinated by uh, what you started to bring up related to the epigenome. Um, and, and maybe you could expand on some of that, uh, especially as it relates to immunity, inflammation, uh, sure. lifestyle. Um, 
So, I mean, I mean fundamentally, um, what you eat and how much you exercise shapes your metabolism, basically. And so, metabolism is playing out in biology in many, many contexts, both in, uh, in, in the immune system, as Allison and Abby mentioned, and also in the epigenome. And I'll give you one example, I think that's the best natural experiment of how, how much you eat can shape your epigenome. Um, and that occurred um, uh, during World War II in Holland. Um, there was a, in the 1944, 1945, there was basically a famine um, because of the inability of uh, southern, uh, the southern part of the Netherlands to get food in because of, uh, of, of the ongoing war. And so women who were pregnant during that period really, really experienced incredible food deprivation. And they've actually followed those children who were born. Uh, obviously, that food deprivation during in utero had no effect on the DNA itself. I mean, it didn't cause mutations. But those children who were uh, experienced that uh, food deprivation in utero now have a, a, a weird, uh, a, 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 it's not a, it, there's not like, uh, it's not a simple explanation, but they, they compared to control groups, have a, a very different spectrum of diseases. Um, and I, I, I won't go through all the, what they are predisposed to, what they're protected from, but it clearly shaped their propensities for certain diseases. Um, and, and, the, and the molecular basis of that really comes down to, again, this idea that your genes are one thing and they, they encode, but you know, what gene gets turned, you know, every cell in your body has the same genetic component, but your liver cell is completely different from your lung cell. And that regulation of what gets turned on when and how much, uh, not completely, but much of it is, is based upon this epigenetic code, this protein wrapped around the DNA that uh, sort of tells the cell in the body, you know, which genes to turn on, which genes to turn off, how much of the genes that are turned on to what level they're turned on. And that intricate regulation, again, is regulated by modifications of that protein coat, which really sense metabolism uh, as one of their sort of primary um, sensing mechanisms. And so the byproducts of metabolisms, you know, really change that protein coat and thereby change what the cell becomes. Um, and, and, and ultimately, you know, what happens in later life in terms of disease propensity. Um, it's not simple, the code is not like a, it's not like a hieroglyphics or something that you can, it, so people have been trying to understand exactly, you know, what these various marks on the chromatin mean, but there clearly is a very strong relationship between, you know, the metabolic state of the cell and, and how these marks are, 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 are deposited and, and persist. And so that, that I think is, you know, from a, science, a basic science point of view, a very clear link between this sort of amorphous concept of how much you exercise and how much you eat to uh, sort of what, what is happening at the level of, of DNA. I mean, the other, th the other thing uh, uh, that is abundantly becoming clear is that, that metabolites also dramatically affect the function of the immune system. So various metabolites, you know, how much glucose availability there is, how much things like lactate that's produced, you know, in tumors per because of high metabolic demand, but obviously occur during exercise as well, have dramatic effects on immune cells. So all, again, the metabolites, all the byproducts of metabolisms are sensed by your DNA at the molecular level, but they're also sensed by immune cells and regulate immune function. So I think, in my mind, the sort of, uh, the sort of, uh, the basic science of these very uh, important, but very difficult to uh, uh, exercise and nutrition have been very difficult to sort of put into a reductionist sort of paradigm of how they could really be exerting their effects. Everybody knows that they work, but to really understand the molecular basis of how they work has been very difficult. And I think we're beginning to sort of crack that code. And I think, you know, part of it I think has to do with the epigenetics, but also um, part of it has to do with direct effects on immune cell function. So. Uh, I think it's sort of an exciting time uh, to be in sort of this, this sort of interface between these sort of important uh, lifestyle issues and, and these clearly uh, molecular drivers of disease.
Thanks, Torin. That was great. So uh, just kind of coming back. So Fabi, again, you talked yesterday about uh, some of the issues related to physical exercise and rehabilitation, et cetera. You brought up aging. You, you obviously study molecular mechanisms uh, associated with that. Maybe you can expand some more uh, on the um, molecular correlates or molecular targets uh, associated with some of these lifestyle domains like, like exercise or nutrition or sleep. Sure. Well, um, I, I really enjoyed the day yesterday. Um, I, I learned a lot, so thank you to all of the speakers. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I always find really striking is kind of the opposing effects of lifestyle medicine and the aging process. Um, you know, of course, when we think about exercise, um, so many of the biological effect, uh, effects of exercise are really kind of anti-symmetric with the aging process. What gets worse with aging seems to get better with exercise. Um, but that also seemed to be thematic through so many of the other topics that we discussed. Um, diet, for example, a poor diet leading to so many of these age-associated pathologies, cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction. In fact, the number one anti-aging um, intervention that we have now is caloric restriction. Um, and, and you know, it's the most robust um, uh, method for preserving um, you know, lifespan and health span, and it's been shown in a number of different organisms. Um, but it also became apparent in the context, for example, of sleep, and you know, kind of the deleterious effects of sleep deprivation on also age-related pathologies um, cognitive dysfunction. And even in the context of stress, what we saw with um, how a stressful environment can actually lead to uh, telomere shortening, cancer, again, all these age-associated um, uh, phenomena. And so it um, does seem that as we move towards this, you know, population that has, um, you know, a worsening lifestyle habits, um, that that is in many ways contributing to an accelerated biological aging response. And so with that in mind then, I think it's kind of interesting to look to the aging field and some of the paradigm shifts that they have recently taken within the last um, 10 years or so um, as to how they view the aging process. Um, and it's really been this idea of um, geroscience where there's been an increased emphasis on trying to understand the biological mechanisms of aging. And this really came about because of the recognition that so many of the number one causes of mortality um, in our population, the number one risk factor is aging. And so what they recognized is that, for example, if we were to take this traditional approach, this approach that we have had, that is to focus, for example, on just cardiovascular health. Well, even if we were to completely solve the problem of, of of cardiovascular disease and eliminate it from our population, that would actually only enhance our lifespan by a couple years because there are other aging um, pathologies that would soon come and affect the individual. And so in geroscience, what they're trying to do is identify these mechanisms that really underlie tissue aging with this idea of can we treat aging as a sort of disease in itself? And this has kind of led to um, what Torin mentioned yesterday in terms of the identification of so-called hallmarks of aging, a very specific list um, that seemed to be fundamental to this, you know, uh, declines in tissue functioning over time, and that includes mitochondrial uh, uh, dysfunction, uh, loss of proteostasis, um, and, and so on. And so I think that there's a really interesting opportunity and, and you know, kind of thinking about the theme of this session in terms of how to integrate um, these different lifestyle approaches and, 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 and topics and themes um, and, and how we can um, potentially think about it in the context of these hallmarks of aging. Um, there's a big push towards increase in um, trying to, to find and identify a biological age metric. Um, one of the things is, is Horvath's clock and looking at DNA methylation, which has actually been shown to be very powerful in terms of predicting um, biological age. Another example in my laboratory, we're looking at trying to identify or, or, or um, kind of come up with a metric um, of cellular Shannon entropy. And our idea here is to kind of integrate many of these um, uh, um, metrics that are associated with the hallmarks of aging into a single biological quote unquote age. 
And um, you know, I think the idea here is can we use a biological metric like this to kind of estimate how effective we are being in our interventions? Are they working? Can we titrate it to make it work even better? Um, so I think you know, the goal would be to be able to tell our patients, uh, eat healthy, eat your carrots, eat your apples, exercise daily, sleep well, relax, and, and essentially you have the biological age of a baby and the wisdom of a centenarian. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I felt exactly like that this morning. Um, so uh, Gwen, maybe you could kind of bring us back full circle to the concepts of inflammation, maybe in the context of this biological aging, because that's been sort of a theme, um, and kind of talk about your experiences or your thoughts, or maybe expanding on what you talked on yesterday, especially with the role of exercise movement or rehab uh, in, in, in that space. Sure. So we've been very, so as we think about lifestyle approaches for all types of chronic and degenerative diseases, it's, it's very clear that we have to take what we've learned from the basic science models understanding of the inflammatory pathways and the metabolic pathways and the genomics of what we've studied and start to apply it and leverage that to change and drive the way we're treating patients. And I don't think we should be doing these in series. We need to be doing these in parallel to move things forward. I, I study back pain and I feel like that's a great model to do this because frankly, clinically, we can't do worse than we're doing right now. Um, so we have, we have continued to do more to people without having improvements in outcomes with increasing rates of disability. So we need to move forward with devising new types of treatment paradigms and it needs to be based in the basic science. And so one of the approaches that we've taken to start to look at this is to use the basic science information to look for biomarkers. And I very much agree with Abi that these biomarkers, these blood-based biomarkers are surrogate measures only and have to be treated as such. And so what we can do is take a two-pronged approach. And I think this is, this is an important way to move things forward, again, in, in parallel, is think about what does the basic science tell us, and we can look for those targeted biomarkers, but at the same time do an unbiased approach where we do a wide sweep. And we learn something that we don't know or wouldn't expect or wouldn't have anticipated from our basic science models and then take that information and bring it back to the basic science models to try to understand what does that mean. So when we identify novel biomarkers that are associated with an outcome, we then bring, can bring that back to the laboratory from a reverse engineering standpoint and start to say, okay, mechanistically, what does that mean? Or is that a real target that we should be pursuing? And that's the approach that we've taken with our biomarker discovery program is going in both directions. And when we started on this about 10 years ago, it was suggested that we were looking for a needle in a haystack. And in fact, really what we were looking for is a needle in a needle stack because there are so many confounders and so many complicating factors looking at this in the, in the um, background of the human um, met metabolism and genomics and everything else that it's very, very difficult. But what we have the advantage of doing is having literally terabytes of information now that we can start to mine in different ways. And so this is the more recent approach that we've taken is by combining not just proteomics, not just blood-based, protein-based biomarkers, but also combining genomics, but layering that on with the clinical paradigm. So what are the clinical comorbidities? What are the demographics of the patients? What are the, um, the uh, uh, medications that they're using? The other, the other pieces that we can actually pull out of even our electronic medical record to start to refine that. And so we're undertaking a very large phenotyping uh, study. We've just been awarded an NIH grant, a Mechanistic Research Center grant, to start to look at large, very large data sets, looking at behaviors, which is going to be hugely important. So lifestyle-related behaviors, um, and again, this is in the context of low back pain, but I think the same paradigm can be applied to many of the chronic diseases that we're discussing. So all the behavioral factors, all the biomechanical factors, and biomechanics means not just what's your range of motion, but also means what's your activity. So we're gonna track all of those sorts of things. And then we're also gonna do a broad sweep with biologics looking at genomics and proteomics and, and uh, microbiome approaches and putting all of that data together it's our hope that we'll start to be able to phenotype patients. 
So while we've had some success in looking at individual biomarkers in terms of predicting response to different treatments, it is very much my hope that as we combine these data sets, those phenotypes will emerge in even more distinct patterns. So in the back pain world, back pain is not back pain is not back pain. There are all types of different contributors, barriers, and phenotypes, but we don't know what they are. So if we can start to identify what is the different type of phenotype and then identify the right treatment for that specific patient at the right time in their course of disease, the hope is that we'll have a more efficacious approach as opposed to our typical medicine approach, which is a bit, frankly, trial and error. Um, so by combining all of those data, and, and this is what I hope to learn from, from many of you in the group, because this is certainly not my wheelhouse, is how we think about that mathematical modeling and how we can use that modeling by, by maintaining all the interconnectivities of those data points, because you can't think about a behavior in isolation. You have to think about how is that behavior related to the biology, and how is that biology then related to the way patients are choosing to move or avoiding movement or, or those types of things that I think is going to lead us in the right direction so that we can truly devise the right treatment for the right patient at the right time for all these, all these chronic conditions. Thanks, Gwen, and that's a terrific segue because that's sort of what I was going to try to bring to this panel, which is that um, precisely that, I mean, you have a complex uh, disease uh, or spectrum or, 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 or syndrome or, or constellation or any word that people want to use, uh, which is all the bad outcomes you've talked about. And then you on layer on top of that on, the other, on another fan is all the lifestyle medicine domains that we now know are impacting those diseases where you can make inroads into those diseases by uh, by doing some of those lifestyle medicine interventions, but yet the piece that connects the, you know, there's a, there's a sort of dot, 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 and then magic happens, and then this is the outcome. So we believe in a, in a mechanistic universe, and so we would like to actually uh, use some tools to try to understand how that magic actually happens. And that tool, as you said, is mathematical modeling. It's computational modeling. So to me, uh, as far as I can tell, there's been little to no application of big data in the lifestyle medicine uh, domain to date. Uh, part of the talk that I gave at the, at the prior symposium, the DOD symposium, uh, was centered on the idea that biobanks are a terrific way to get started at that. So they, they may not have everything you need, but they're a good starting point. And I know that there are some uh, potential longitudinal biobanks uh, associated with lifestyle medicine. Um, now, the, the point is then, as Gwen said, you're going to generate large amounts of data. And, uh, and, and the and technology development means that in two to three years we'll be, we'll, we'll, we will look wildly out of date with whatever proposal we put in because it'll be a whole new technology platform. It'll all be done in single cells and then it'll be done at you know, even, even uh, uh, higher resolution than that. Um, and so then you get this gigantic possibility of big data. Now the, the promise there is that you're going to discover hidden patterns. You're gonna find your needle in a needle stack or needle in a haystack and, and hopefully you won't poke your toe uh, uh, while you're doing that. So, the, but the, pro the, 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 the problem with that is that I think pe people need to understand, and this is part of a discussion we had, we were fortunate to have Andy Moore from Google, uh, who heads their AI efforts at this uh, uh, DOD meeting uh, uh, a couple of days ago, um, is that the, the entire tool set of big data was developed around uh, business applications. And it was, it was developed around uh, helping corporations sort out their business process. And those are really closed and understandable systems. They've got their products, they're, they're in stores, their stores might be all over the world, there's products coming in, products going out, but the system is pretty well understood uh, from the point of view of what, what it is. And so then you can, but what's missing is of course the, the, the knowledge of all the, where all the pieces are and, and accounting for it and then using algorithms to figure out that, you know, it turns out that if I put this kind of cheese next to that kind of beer, they, the both of them sell better. And that's kind of where big data came from, is, is applications like that. Of course, there's got, uh, other applications, you know, related to, to demographics, social networking, all these kind of things. Again, those may have some more hidden variables, but they're still much more understood. We don't have anywhere near the understanding in biology and, 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 and medicine, and we have nowhere near the data. So even as much as we think we're generating big data, the pitfall is we're generating small data. We're generating huge amounts of data about a very small number of people proportionally. Right? And so that creates a very tall and thin data matrix, which means that it's either difficult, impossible, or misleading to try to purely use data-centered approaches uh, to, to, to get an understanding of what's going on. And, and, and so the, 
and, and we've, we've heard this thrown out there as a, as a glib statement that correlation is not causality, although, and, although now we have this entire domain of, of um, causal modeling, which is really just about correlational modeling, but with some element that says this must have come before that, so this must cause that. I'm not so sure that uh, the fact that I put on my shoes and then I showed up here means the two things caused each other, but okay, we, we, you know, we can go with that. Now, the, the, the real problem is you can't play the models forward to really predict anything. They're data visualization tools. So you, when you're looking at a network diagram, and you, they're static. They're, di they're representations of data um, that can help you suggest connections and hypotheses, and then you can trace after them. You can say, oh, that looks like something I want to study, but it doesn't guarantee that, that it will work. Um, and um, the real problem also is that you can't play them backwards. So you can't essentially play them backwards under different conditions and figure out where the outcome came from, right? You can only just do the study, get the data, and compare the two outcomes, right? So that's pretty um, cumbersome and expensive. Um, and then the, the other important part is that you, you have to have a large enough training data set. This is the entire uh, conundrum and problem of the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world, which is the training data. And that's why they are expending huge resources to get enormous training data sets because it's, a, it's, a, it's an inherent limitation of the approaches that are, that are inherent in machine learning or what we now call uh, artificial intelligence. So there's this alternative approach which is called mechanistic computational modeling which really just means trying to use your insights which can come from knowledge. We heard last night that there are alternative ways in which we can uh, ascertain or, or get some comfort with what is true. Um, uh, there are evidence hierarchies, there's other ways to do it. So that's one way and we can do that in the biology space or the medicine space uh, and we've done that. Um, uh, in fact, I don't know, if, can't see if Steve Chang is in the audience, but uh, Steve Chang was there, he's the CEO of Immunetrix, this company that I helped found. We made mathematical models of inflammation by having a group of, let's call them experts, but it was really just us, sitting around and uh, going, well, we've read the literature and this is what we think happens where uh, this inflammatory cell gets activated by that mediator which activates this and then it impacts that physiology and we drew up influence diagrams but we did huge amounts of literature searches, right, where we put, for example, more emphasis on, hey, if it's been done in a human study and they've got the data, that means more than if they did it in some cells and so we developed our own evidence hierarchy. But in any case, it was a team-based effort and we created these mechanistic models. Now there's an alternative way to do that which is to get the data, to, to especially over time, dynamic, do these dynamic network inference uh, analyses which we do, um, and then you use that to help augment what you already kind of know or, or hopefully to, uh, to validate or verify some of the things you know. But the point is that you're generating these models that are abstractions of the biology. And from that you can lead to things like uh, digital twins, meaning if I get enough data about uh, that, that where I abstract the human, uh, for example, in 2015, we abstracted a trauma patient into a blood compartment, a lung compartment, um, and a sort of tissue compartment where injury occurred, right? But we had sophisticated modeling that related to the way fluids moved around and cells did things to each other, et cetera. Um, and then you can, you can get data from, from longitudinally and uh, in, in these individuals and then you can calibrate those models to the data, right? So it's not, it's, it, you, you can use the same data stream that you'd be using for purely data-driven modeling, which is machine learning and AI, but now you're, you're, you're instead using a series of algorithms that fit the models to the data by essentially tweaking knobs, which are parameters, until the curves pretty much match the trajectories of the data that you have. Now, you're never going to get as good of a fit, if you will, to the data using that approach as if you did just plain old polynomial regression or something like that. But the point is, you are fitting the totality of the data to a single model. So you're optimizing across the whole system or optimizing globally, right? Now you can create huge uh, clouds of individuals, of simulated individuals from that original data that was, that was really just maybe 20, 30 patients. And now you can generate 10,000 variants and now it's a simulated population. Or, you, or like Immunetrix does, you can generate a billion variants. You could generate uh, 8 billion variants and you could say, what is it going to look like on planet Earth if I was to try to deploy this or that therapy for sepsis or whatever, right? And of course, no clinical trial is ever going to be that big. And so the, and the possibility exists that 
when you do such a huge simulation, you might gain confidence in something that isn't really true. So you could do spot checking of say 10,000 simulated individuals at a time to give you a sense of what it might look like in a real trial, et cetera. So what I'm saying is that brings us to the final stage, which is you could do these in silico clinical trials. Now, when, you, when, I, when I was just incredibly, uh, sort of incredibly uh, uh, energized by the discussion yesterday, but I felt as if there's a third way that was just not discussed because people didn't have a background in it. It's not randomized controlled trials or I just believe because I know that if my child runs with scissors, I'm gonna get killed. There is this alternative way where I simulate a child running around with scissors and I go, hey, I, I simulated 10 billion children running around with, children, with, with scissors and it's true that some number of them did not get hurt, but look, here's the number that I predicted would get hurt if they ran around with scissors. So what that means is that you can have a third way. It can have the power of a true trial without doing the full trial. Uh, in fact, the FDA is fully behind this now. So in silico clinical trials, something we, we coined that term in a paper in 2004, is now baked into the FDA funding. And so um, uh, I think that's something perhaps people are not aware of. The FDA is strongly encouraging this. And so my, my suggestion, and I'll just stop there, is that perhaps lifestyle medicine could be one of those domains where this is really adopted precisely because it's so difficult to do these randomized clinical trials. So if the end goal is to get to the trials, that justifies all the data collection at the multiple levels, genomic, et cetera, microbiome, immune system, because the end goal is the trial that you couldn't otherwise do. So I'll just leave it there. Um, I don't know if we have a couple minutes to take some questions. Yeah, so I mean, well, I'll leave it to the panel to answer about specific uh, uh, points that you raised, and we could definitely have an offline discussion about what markers you might want to use. I would just say, and, and maybe leave it to, to Abe and, 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 and uh, also Allison. Could, could uh, I? You know, that, that, that the one thing I was going to get at is bringing the patient back to balance, it's a dynamic thing. Abe, you pointed out that your, could, who you are tomorrow is not the same so, as who you were today. Uh, so. I, it's important to, to consider that the system is very dynamic. And so it should not be surprised that diet and physical activity has a positive impact on whatever organ system that you look at, including the immune system. Because after all, after life is optimized after reproduction, after reproduction, the goal is survival. And in order for you to survive, the system has to adapt. And I think if we, continue, if we realize that if clinical practice is based on that fact, then you could repair what is broken, but at the same time, you can tap of what is available there. So it's not just a, a surgical approach. It could, be, you know, it could be replacement, it could be just tapping into what, what you have. Now, in terms of the inflammation markers, uh, I, you know, people think, talk about inflammation all the time. 
but 99% of the time, I don't think they know what they're talking about. We talk about IL-6 as pro-inflammatory. As an immunologist, I would say that is the, uh, that is a failure to recognize the pleiotropic effect of IL-6. IL-6 is both good and bad. It's about context, it's about, uh, it, it's about um, concentrations. And so from a clinical perspective, uh, today, you know, we heard about Humira, you, you know, we, we have all these biologic therapies, and yet in the clinic, there is no standardized testing of how to determine, uh, say, simple things like IL-6 and CNF-alpha. You, can, uh, you, can, you can order those tests, but you have to ask yourself, there is no such thing as normal value. I'm not a clinician, but ask clinicians in, in, in the room. Is there I-06 standard? There isn't, as far as I can. So I think in terms of clinical translation research, that would be a fertile ground uh, on how to develop those tools so it's a practical thing. But it should not, uh, for clinicians, it should not be a deterrent for you to use those markers uh, using the available tools that you have. So it, it's balancing what you know versus the tools that you have and look, you know, think about the limits of, of how you can use that tool in helping your patient. Yeah, I, I very much don't think there's going to be a biomarker, a set of biomarker, or even a panel of biomarkers that are gonna help us specifically guide treatment. It's gonna be patterns. And, that, and that's, I think, what you're getting at, is it's gonna be a pattern of the whole presentation of the person. And, and eventually, we will easily be able to get to that not being as cumbersome as, as it is right now, because we can do a data dump from the electronic medical record, we can do a data dump from their genetic sequence that's already you know, in place in the EHR, and, and maybe a couple lab tests that all start to work together, but it's gonna be patterns, not. Which, which fits so well with the holistic approach, right? Right. That So I know Torin, you had you had a comment. Yeah, just trying to. I, I think this concept of balance is very interesting, but I think there's another concept that uh, I think is also potentially relevant to sort of lifestyle um, interventions. Is that this concept known as hormesis, where uh, the, uh, which is this idea that a little bit of stress uh, to an organism produces a response that actually protects it against a larger stress that comes along. And actually, just yesterday in Nature, there was a paper published. Um, Probably no one's read yet because it just got published last <laughs> night. But um, I actually reviewed it, so I know the paper well. So, uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, so, you, and again, it's very very basic, but it's, it involves worms. Uh, and, and if you take genetically identical worms, and in a genetic in, in a defined environment, so they're all in the same plate, you would say, okay, their genes are identical, their environment is identical, they should all live the same time, right? But they don't, obviously. If you look at the lifespan of that plate of worms, you know, it follows what's called a Gompertz distribution, so that very few worms die in the beginning, and then you know, worms start to die, and then there are some worms that live quite long, right? And so identical environment, identical genes, different lifespans, right? What is the basis for that? Why? I mean, what's different? And so what this group of researchers did at the University of Michigan is they looked very early on at the worms in these two different lifespan groups who live shorter and longer, again. And what they observed was that there was, at very early age, when they were developing, the worms that live longer, uh, paradoxically, had an increase in oxidative stress. There was an increase in reactive oxygen species. That produced an epigenetic change in those worms that wasn't in the worms that had lower oxidative stress. And as the worms got older, the ones that had increased oxidative stress when they were young actually had this protective response so that they had lower oxidative stress when they got older and they lived longer. The ones that didn't get stress when they were young didn't have that response, had higher oxidative stress and lived shorter. So again, when you think about what exercise does, what eating less does, you know, and, and people say, oh, stress is bad. Well, stress isn't always bad. Stress sometimes tells your body, we've got some issues here. We've got we've to work with this. We've got to make some changes. And those changes tend to be beneficial. And at least in the case of worms, if you're stressed when you're growing up, uh, uh, you know, uh, then you live longer. 
and, and, and you, I think in many ways exercise and all these things do produce this oxidative stress, which is actually good for you as opposed to bad for you. Paul, or sorry, Esther, okay. Thank you. Um, so actually, I wasn't going to comment on this, but since you mentioned it, Gerdau Stadpar at Stanford and previously the Rockefeller uh, about 15 years ago showed that stress, acute stress, enhances um, uh, the immune response in babies uh, getting vaccines. So it's counterintuitive. You'd expect the cortisol would make the immune response less, but so it fits. So, but what I was going to mention in terms of big data, the data I showed you yesterday for the GSA study, uh, we used big data to analyze it. And in many ways, the environment in, uh, in situ, in office buildings, in people, in real space, in real time, is, is a similar kind of big data problem to what you're all talking about here in terms of lifestyle. Uh, because there are many, many variables, and um, including social interactions, mood, psychology, uh, and the physical environment uh, as well. So with the GSA study, we used the discovery approach, just let's see what comes out when you put in all this big data. Um, and, and then weeded out and turned around to a hypothesis-driven approach. And we found that very, very effective in, in being able to identify specific questions that we had. We have a follow-on study with IARPA, which is the intelligence community's DARPA, where we're kind of throwing everything into a, a hopper. Um, and, um, and the, so I think you need to have the, the hypothesis-driven approach added on to the discovery approach. Um, but with, with the IARPA uh, study, we're able to do predictive modeling on the questions that we're asking. And the reason is because we have not only big data, but deep data. So we have, we're following people for eight weeks continuous heart rate variability monitoring. That gives you an enormous amount of data, uh, which you can then turn around and use for predictive modeling. And that's, I think that's gonna be the future, is predictive modeling. That's two very, very good points there. And I should also mention that m models are by definitions, uh, they're hypotheses. So especially mechanistic models, but even uh, straight up data-driven models, they, a network depiction of the data is a hypothesis about relationships, and then of course you have to go test it. So uh, really, it's not that the two approaches are uh, at odds. They, they, it, it, I think maybe people don't, don't uh, realize that and don't, don't follow that, but they absolutely are designed to dovetail. Um, maybe Paul, I know you were waiting, so. Well, it's a bit of a challenge to the, to the panel here. So shouldn't we also consider that maybe we're trying to climb up the wrong tree in our ambition to get to the moon? So. Um, can we leave lifestyle medicine in the hands of physicians, right? So, because what we're also looking at here are the limitations of our previous approaches. If we just, we have to admit it, we have no good theories in medicine, really, right? I look at brain health, I know the brain. I come at it from theory, I know what's available, but it's very little. So in some sense, yes, we might aspire to changing the game, but do we really have all the tools in our hands, and are we also really talking to the right communities? And I'm really doubting that. So that's my challenge to you. Are we the right people? Are the physicians the right people to whom we should leave lifestyle medicine? Or should we rethink really medicine completely and fundamentally, starting from theory? <laughs> maybe, maybe Dr. Wolf can, can handle that, uh, put him on the spot since he's holding a microphone and clearly wants to say something. We have a good that's, that's obviously a strong challenge, yes. Uh, abandoned physicians. Um, so the, the comment I wanted to make was, I, and I may have missed this earlier in your presentation, but I, I, think, I think it's helpful uh, to distinguish between big data, machine learning, and uh, predictive modeling and simulation modeling. Um, and, and in defense of our dinner panel, uh, what, I, what I think we were saying was that uh, in addition to RCTs and observational epidemiology, we need other kinds of research methodologies to handle the kinds of questions we're going to be confronting in lifestyle medicine. And I would include uh, simulation modeling among those. And I just wanted to clarify whether uh, you're meant, you mean to include that when you call this big data AI, but you're also including things like agent-based modeling. And so that's mechanistic. So the, 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 the second bullet point is exactly that. So agent-based models, uh, of course, the, 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 the most uh, sort of time-tested method is 
differential equation based models, uh, but then their uh, you know agent based models are a terrific tool. We've used it, uh, and yeah. so yeah, and absolutely. That's, that's and I know you did mention you kind of alluded to big data, et cetera, uh, in your in your in your points that you made. But I, I felt as if uh, that was that was not quite baked into the the, the this is how the solution's got to happen. But I yeah. think I think the point to be made in in the context of last night's conversation is just as we need things like grade for judging the quality of RCTs and Helm for uh, judging observation epidemiologists, we need tools for grading the quality of other kinds of study designs. And I'd, I'd put big data in there. Uh, we did a big data study in San Diego where we had tons of census tract data that we threw into the kitchen sink and uh, came out finding that the largest predictor of life expectancy was chocolate milk consumption. Um, turned out that uh, some of the data was uh, consumer purchasing data that was modeled by uh, businesses based on socioeconomic status. So poverty, for example, was highly predictive of chocolate milk consumption, so we ended up basically modeling poverty's prediction of life expectancy, but it looked like chocolate milk. So the notion from last night of garbage in, garbage out becomes important. Um, but I think uh, uh, when we talk about life course perspectives and the ability, I mean, NCI is using simulation modeling with, to predict the effectiveness of cancer screening tests that the Preventive Services Task Force now relies on to make cancer screening recommendations. The same can be done with lifestyle medicine. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine had a whole report using agent-based modeling to look at tobacco control. So I think there's a, a real future with that. Right. No, yeah, and agent-based modeling is used for things like uh, in our Graduate School of Public Health to predict epi epidemic outbreaks. We've used it all the way down to the micro scale to predict what histology of uh, fibrotic liver is gonna look like uh, in a context of chronic liver inflammation or to uh, with work with Gwen, uh, what pressure ulcers are going to look like on patients with spinal cord injuries. So, uh, but again, using these these mechanisms to help uh, drive predictions about uh, trajectories or pattern formation, and then going and validating some of that. Um, we'll take uh, the last. Yeah, uh, so the last. I'll be quick. Um, yeah. So, as a, speaking as a clinician, I've never met two patients exactly the same, which is what makes it joyous. But in order to do my job, I have to see the patterns. When it comes to lifestyle medicine, I give the people all of the choices that can be made, and they have to, according to their experience, choose that I'm going to start with relationships or I'm going to start with uh, sleep. Um, so here's my question. Are we looking for the common ground that all of those appropriate lifestyle cho choices lead to? And that's the graphic that you showed, like, is it just inflammation or, I bet you've convinced me, is, is it immune function? Are we going that way? or? Is big data big enough that we could construct a world in which the myriad possibility of choices and the combination of choices can be modeled? And we can figure out that Gwen, who wants to start with relationships and sleep, is going to behave differently than I just want to go exercise and leave me alone. So I mean, I, I think the answer to that is actually brought up in what Paul said. The, the, real, the real problem is, do it's, 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 it's not just the data collection, it's knowing what to collect, knowing what is the paradigm that, that is likely to be important enough so that you can drive the appropriate data collection because you simply cannot collect all the data because what is all the data, right? And so the, it's, it's not scalable, you can't pay for it, you can't uh, uh, operationalize it. So you collect the data you collect, but it's not clear that those data are actually the directly useful to driving the insight. Uh, you might find that, yeah, uh, associating chocolate milk consumption with some outcome. I could also probably guess that in their data set they might have found that, you know, uh, the size of your shoe, which might indicate how tall you are or how, how you walk, uh, is associated with some outcome. But it's obviously not But possible. are we, we going to get to the point, or is it the goal of this group to get to the point where we're going to say, like, inflammation is the common pathway and everything is going to lead to that and then... Ge genetic uh, roulette wheel, what happens? So I don't think that that's the goal. I, okay. I, uh, you know, I would love to, to be able to say that everything is IL-6, right? <laughs> and that's not the case. We talk about patterns. I like to use the term fingerprints because you can have a fingerprint of, an out let us say you're looking for physical activity, right? A, a good outcome physical activity would be what? cognitive improvement in a certain cognitive domain. What are those fingerprints in terms of cognition? But we know it's not just the brain that's being affected there. 
It could be your movement. It could be uh, the immune system. I, I don't like to use the term inflammation because of the negative connotation. Inflammation is actually good. You cannot have an immune system without in an inflammatory process. So, it, it's really, uh, so as an immunologist, to me that is critical. But I realize that, uh, again, it, uh, let's go back to the, the, the basic thing, as I said. The system, meaning uh, biology, is not a vacuum. There is, uh, there is dynamism in the system. So the challenge for us, I think from a, from a clinical point of view, is to be able to synthesize the information that you get. And this so. is where the power of computational biology comes in, and computational medicine, and say, okay, I would like to improve the outcome of this particular patient or with a particular problem. I have all this data, so I think the challenge today, and this is where I think uh, the 21st century medical sciences is going, is to be able to synthesize all that big data into something that is meaningful that you can help your patient. Well, the, other, so, the, other, go ahead, the, the other thing I think we need to do is think about the context in which we're collecting the data. So if we are, have a very clean background where we're collecting the data in response to a single intervention, we're never gonna get to these answers. And so it needs to be, we need to allow the messiness of pragmatic trials where there are multiple interventions coexisting in the same time that are influencing all of these all of these mechanisms downstream if we're going to tease that out. It's really messy and really complicated, but that's where we lean on our colleagues that are doing some of this advanced modeling <coughs> and networking strategies to allow us to make sense of that messiness. Because if we do it in a in a very controlled situation, that's the only answer we're going to achieve. And as a clinician, that's not even helpful because I'll never have a patient that is doing one thing. So, so the reason, thank you Kim Williams, thank you Victoria for eating into your time a little bit on the next panel. This is the crux of the meeting. This is the reason that Ardmore has thought this would be a breakthrough occasion to have these extremely learned but difficult and silo-busting conversations. And in each one of our speakers, my colleagues up here, thank you because eye-opening things that you're doing, from Allison, to, and finally on the right panel, because I just didn't know you that well. <laughs> but, but I mean, th the, the terminologies we use, the pathways that we lay out as a result of this white paper, will be read nationally as a way forward. And if we can give instances, to your point, Eddie, of how do we move advanced modeling at a time when some of our research methodologies aren't gonna be able to answer the questions that we need to have answered, and yet, the community here that uses words like inflammation, we use words like stress too. There's good stress, there's bad stress. How can we begin to shape a pathway for research funding agencies going forward to say, what is the most impactful questions down to the level of the microbiome and the epigenetic changes up through population-based trials that impact those six domains that drive 90% of disease, disability, and death? That are behaviors and environment. They all come mitigated ultimately through the six areas that you guys just mentioned here, but the outside world, outside this room at the university club would love, I think, to have a integrative view of what might be value. And I think between the, inst and so the, the things that you are knows better than this half of my brain, which is preventive medicine, family medicine, lifestyle medicine, it lives in this room right now. And so where this comes together of a, is the white paper which we're jumping to the final slide of this meeting, but we are going to be looking to, we were going to write the paper to summarize the key elements of the whole two days, and we're going to need a crisp writing team of representative people on this panel and every other panel to say, this is what we think is impactable. This is what we think is actionable. Um, because I think the market, broadly defined, is ready for it. And that is why this session was the juncture between yesterday, which was deep and broad around the domains, today it begins on what do we know in the deepest, best area of basic science that's emerging literally as we speak to kind of bring them together. So thank you, that's, that's first of all, and to get to Eddie's, well, where are we? that's 
if you go back and read the background of this meeting, it says it right there. Right. And this is the hard work because our communities oftentimes aren't connected. And our funding agencies certainly are not connected. And by the NIH portfolio research that I cited in my opening talk, they're not even, they're not relating the two at all. Less than 3% of their total budget and their 17% prevention budget has anything to do with two behaviors. So Eddie said, if I want to work on sleep and I work and work on relationships, what's the likelihood that's anywhere in that radar screen? Nowhere. Is that even the right question? I don't know. But that's how people live their lives. So this is hugely, I, I'm sitting here furiously writing notes, but it is so good. So th that's why I hope you heard some of the opportunities here, but we're going to have to craft it. We're going to have to put it together, right? So where in the world do endocrine disrupting chemicals fit as part of this that Leo talked about yesterday? that begin actually in utero or pre-utero, right? You guys are tracking those effects. You see them. I mean, it's very exciting, and I think we have a winner here. So I'll sit down, shut up, turn it back to you, Yor. Oh, that, Mike, those are terrific final question. comments. So yeah, I'd like to again thank all my co-panelists and uh, a big round of applause.